Good morning to everyone in our sanctuary and online. We are glad that you are with us to worship this morning. We want to welcome Stan and Adele Tennant today, um, as Pastor Janet is on study leave, and we anticipate having a wonderful time of fellowship and worship together. I have some announcements for you. We want you to know that 16 coats were, were donated and taken to the Lookup Center just uh, last week, and we had three large containers of household goods and supplies that went to uh, Starting Strong, as well as monetary donations, so we made, uh, we took a check for them. And it worked out so well this time, Robert Holland was telling us in Sunday school that um, when we ask them specifically, what do you need? they indicated that they had sh a shelf full of fleece blankets, but they didn't have any silverware. So they asked for specific items and we were able to meet some specific needs. They're getting ready to put together Christmas uh, baskets for these young folks that have come out of the foster care system and now they're on their own. So Starting Strong has been blessed. We have been blessed to be able to participate with that and um, we wanted you to know what the outcome of that was. I thank you, uh, the Good News Club people, I'm gonna give you a little update on Good News Club in a minute, but we want to thank you for your help in preparing the packets, the take-home bags last week, and we need your help again. We have three sets of those for three schools that we need to prepare, so during, after the service in Fellowship Hall, we will have you help us do that as well. I want to draw your attention to the announcements that are printed for you. Our Sunday school class continues every week and it is for um, children through adults. It is, we can meet the needs of all those age groups and we find that it is helpful to have intergenerational um, interaction and we invite you to be a part of that at 930 every Sunday. We want you to uh, remember the families that are in grief, the Giesick family, Fran um, also is still recovering. She's in her new apartment and we encourage you to be in touch with them. The memorial service for Frank will be on Friday and there's visitation Thursday at Cobber Fraley here in Pataskala. Remember Jim Charles as his treatments uh, continue and look for good news there. The, the tumor is shrinking, so we continue to pray for him and Randy Conway, all of those who have cancer. There is a list of people with physical concerns and we draw your attention to that and ask you. We give praise that Jean's, the, uh, the cousin of Jean Johnson's uh, newborn grandson has made a miraculous um, turnaround in surgery the first weeks of his life. Um, and God has been gracious to hold him close. We are um, starting Christmas Child. If you would like to take a box and fill it, you could also make a monetary donation if you prefer. Um, the regular session meeting is this Thursday, the 19th, and the Bereans will be on the 26th with a potluck luncheon. Uh, Pastor Janet is away for a few days, but Jean Johnson can take any prayer requests at, and pass on any information if you need pastoral care. So keep that in mind. Are there any other announcements that I need to highlight at this time? Well, it is my pleasure to tell you about what's going on at Good News Club. Uh, last week, oh, the, throughout the six weeks, we are... Um, emphasizing that God is a God of power and glory. And we use those signs to help the children understand. We talked about how last week, how God, or the week before, how God provided a way for us to know him. And that was the first lesson, I can know God. This week, we had a lesson that helped us to understand trusting Jesus because he's all powerful. And uh, it was, we had a study in Mark where 
Jesus was tired. He had been teaching all day, and he went across the Sea of Galilee with men who knew about boats. But when they got in the middle of Galilee, the storm came, and no matter how hard they rode, they couldn't go against the wind, and the waves were coming up over the boat, and they were frightened. Have you ever been frightened or worried about something? Are you worried about maybe having to move and go to a different school and making friends? Are you worried about things out of your control? Are you worried that someone you love might get sick? Are you worried about things under your bed? We learned that we can trust Jesus because he's all powerful. So the disciples woke him up and he spoke to the storm. And we were reminded of the week before when we said that the word of God, God spoke, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke the universe into existence. We know that Jesus is God because he spoke to the storm. And in my mind, the way I see it is he whispered, peace, be still. And it was just like this. You know all those wiggly little children I ask you to pray for? Every eye looked like saucers. And they were just so the voice of the Spirit of God whispered, peace be still, over that little group of wiggly kids, and they listened to that. And I told them that the sea was like glass, where there had been waves and wind and scary things. Now it was smooth as glass. Now, we still have some uh, wiggliness in our small groups, and that is because we have seven or eight children at a table with one teacher. I ask you to be praying about space, tables, chairs, and teachers. And we still have that need. But here's what God has been teaching us. We put first graders, second graders, third graders, we put a, a variety and we've paired them up as Bible buddies. Now, I don't have one of the older children's Bibles. That's the, the new problem we had. We ran out of Bibles and had to order again. We had 156 children registered by this time. So the younger ones have this. It's, a, it's not a full Bible, but uh, it has a lot of the major things. That, uh, that The whole idea is that the child can read this for themselves. So we paired up with Bible buddies. The third graders, second graders, are helping a first grader. And the genius of God is that when you explain something to somebody else, when you help somebody else find their way, you learn, you grow, you have more skill and more knowledge. So in helping each other, they're learning. God worked that out. We're, we're still looking for more space and more tables and more chairs and more teachers. But in the meantime, God is providing. By far, Good News Club is the most exciting thing God has ever called me to do. <laughs> Praise you, Lord Jesus, for the conflict, for the, for the um, obstacles for the problems that you're walking us through. Can you believe that a church of our size is ministering to 156 children in four schools? We're not doing it alone. We have helpers. But thank you for your support of this. It is a wonderful thing. Praise God. Will you join me in prayer about it now? Lord Jesus, you are all-powerful and you are able to do beyond what we ask and what we can understand and what we know about what we can dream about you are able to raise up a new generation for your glory thank you father i pray that you would be with us and make us like those children make us be hungry for your word open our eyes and our hearts that we can receive it and be blessed by it and changed by it and that we can reach others in our community. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. We're going to hear the prelude and then we will worship again. We will worship continued this morning.
If you are able, stand and let's be called to worship with Psalm 89, verse 11. We re read responsively. The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. Our opening hymn today is number 209, This Is The Day. It's a very short piece and we'll sing it through twice. We will pause for a moment of silent confession as we think about uh, what we need to bring before God and ask. And we will read a prayer of confession together in unison. Eternal God, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. I don't need to introduce Stan to you. He's been here many times. We always enjoy uh, hearing him speak and, and fellowshipping with him and uh, his wife, Adele. So we will have our proclamation of God's word from Stan. We will be called to the word of God by saying together our uh, call to God's word. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? Lord Jesus, you are the word. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the way that we know, can know God. 
So we pray that you would speak to us today, change our hearts, and Lord, may your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. You about right here? Is that about good? Okay. Well, it's good to be back. It's been quite a while. Um, I'm not sure how the scheduling worked on that. Several things got changed. And I'm supposed to be back here again in about another three or four weeks. So that's close enough together that I could actually kind of play off of the, the one sermon against the other. <coughs> um, so I got a little um, scratchy throat here. This morning is the next installment of what has become a very long-running and irregular sermon series on the life of Jesus. <coughs> and we've been working primarily in the Gospel of Mark. If you turn to Mark 6, we'll be um, spending some time there. Now, the background of this is Jesus had just sent out his disciples, or his apostles, not the disciples in general, the apostles, the 12 that he chose as his special representatives. He had sent them out on a ministry trip by themselves, kind of a training mission, gave them authority to preach, to teach, cast out demons, heal the sick. And they, and they had just come back, and they were wanting to talk about it, and he goes, let's go, let's, let's get away. Guys, come with me. Let's go on a retreat. There's, pe there's people everywhere. The crowds are driving us crazy. Let's get in the boat and go somewhere where we can just get away, and then we can kind of unwind and debrief. And so they get in the boat, and the crowds, rather than be left behind, figure out roughly where they're going across the lake and go overland to get there. So Jesus gets there, there's a whole crowd waiting for him. And he says he had compassion on them. The disciples probably are going, are you kidding me? Jesus, Jesus is like, this is ministry, guys. This is ministry. Here are sheep without a shepherd. Here are people that need to be fed. And Jesus is going to feed them spiritually. He's going to teach them. And then he's going to feed them physically. The disciples don't know that, though. This is a well-known story. This is the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, every kid that's been in Sunday school for very long or every kid that's been in VBS for very long has heard this story. This is a It's a wonderful story. Now, as we've seen before, Jesus performed thousands of miracles. We've only got record in the four Gospels of about 33 or 34 of them, maybe. But he performed thousands of miracles. It's interesting that this is the only miracle, other than something to do with the resurrection, this is the only, we might call a ministry miracle, that Jesus performed for the benefit of others. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels. That means something. This was a very, very important event. And that's why I'm focusing on this. <clears throat> We tend to think of miracles, at least I always have, sort of as an individual one-off. You know, you go, oh yeah, there's the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead miracle. There's the, um, I wrote down a couple of them. There's the water into wine miracle, like these little independent stories. Here we have two miracles, in this reading for today, we have two miracles that are linked. The one references the other. So you have the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. So let's read this this morning. It's a little long, but I want you to be, have it clear in your head. Thank you very much. Starting, let's see, chapter 6, starting in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Remember, they have just come back from this ministry trip they'd been on for many, many weeks. 
Because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. Jesus said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Remember that? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day. So hours have gone by. So his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. A very practical suggestion here. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much money on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, Jesus said? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Sort of an aside, like, oh yeah, and two fish. Jesus directed the, them, the disciples, or his apostles, to have the people sit down on groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of 150s, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Now, most people are familiar. It was a mixed crowd, almost assuredly, which means there was, could have been two to three times as many people. So this is a really large crowd. Now, usually that's the end of the discussion about this miracle. But let's go on. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida. They're going to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, and after leaving them, the crowd, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. So he's up high enough that he can look out across the lake and he can see the little boat out there rowing away from him and they're not getting anywhere. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it's me. He said, I don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. And here's the critical thing. They had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. That's the phrase that got my attention. We would think of these as two separate miracles. You've got the feeding of the 5,000 and you've got Jesus walking on the, on the water, which scares them badly because your average person can't walk on the water. So you see somebody or something out walking on the water, you're assuming what? This isn't human. <laughs> this is a ghost, this is a spirit, a specter, this is a demon that, that, that scares them badly. But they did not understand about the loaves. So there's something about the feeding of the 5,000 that is supposed, they were, there's something they should have caught about the feeding of the 5,000 that would have kept them from being scared. That's a really interesting, and I want to look at that this morning. So that's what we're going to be looking at. See if we can figure out what it is that the disciples missed in the feeding of the 5,000 that would have changed their, um, their reaction to Jesus. Now there's a little bit of background that's going to help us to try to understand this. First of all, just to get a picture of what the feeding was about, what do you picture when you picture a loaf of bread? Right. Yeah, you know, a baguette, yeah. <laughs> loaf can mean a number of different things. If you go to the store for a loaf of bread, you're probably going to come back with something that's about that long and is about that square, right? Roughly. Or if you go to Panera, you might get one of their artisan loaves. It's a big, you know. The word that is used here indicated it was uh, the bread at that time would have been a disc about that big. 
and about that thick. Think flatbread. Think Middle Eastern flat. This is the Middle East. Think Middle Eastern flatbread. That's what that's what we're dealing with here. This is nowhere near as big as a our loaf of bread. That's one thing to keep in mind. The other is, he said, yeah, and two fish, sort of almost an aside. One of the Gospels uses a specific word that means a particular small fish. So when it says we had two fish, this don't picture the disciples go, yeah, we got a couple carp here. Or we've got, yeah, we got a couple nice bass here. Don't even think, don't think bass, don't even think bluegill. Think sardine. Little, little fish. The bread was the main course. This is a very poor area. The bread is the main course. The little fish was one that was typically pickled or salted to preserve it. This was just like a, this was like a, a, a very simple meal. The bread was the main course, and every now and then you take a little bite of the, the, uh, the salted fish or pickled fish just for a little, a little burst of flavor. But the issue is they're mentioned only because it shows the impossibility of the situation. There's nothing magical about the five loaves. There's nothing specific about the two fish. It's not an allegory where the two mean something. They had virt- This isn't enough food for Jesus and the disciples, let alone 5,000 men plus five or 10,000 more people floating around. This, it's absurd for him to go, you feed them. And they're like, <laughs> with it, <laughs> this is impossible. That's the point. It is completely impossible. Now, another thing you need to know is about Jewish expectations at this time. Obviously, there was the expectation of the Messiah. This one promised repeatedly through the Old Testament prophets who is going to come. He's going to take the throne of his father, David, and he was going to throw out whoever was oppressing the Jews. Deliver Israel. That was one expectation. The Messiah, there was a person who was coming, a specially anointed one. That's what the word Christ means, specially anointed. There was also the um, expectation of a figure who was called the prophet. Now, in Deuteronomy 18, this is at the end of of the books of Moses. Moses is about the end of his life. He's giving a review of the history of the Exodus. And he tells the people of Israel, this is Deuteronomy 18, 15 and following, that there will come another prophet like me who will lead the, your, the people Israel. So for over a thousand years, Moses' time is about 1300 BC. For over a thousand years, the Jewish people had been waiting for the prophet who was like Moses. So you've got people looking for the Messiah, the son of David, who's going to sit on the throne, primarily a political figure. You've also got the prophet who is like Moses, whatever exactly that means. So they've been waiting for him. There was also the expectation of the return of the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Because at the end of the Old Testament in Malachi, It says, before the Messiah, no, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, I will send Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons back to the fathers. It's in Malachi Malachi 4. It's the last chapter of the Old Testament. So they were expecting Elijah, the Old Testament prophet Elijah, to show up at some point. And to further complicate things, there's a section in the, the book of Isaiah, it's quite long, and there's a section in the book of Isaiah where there's a series of prophecies about what's known as the suffering servant of God. That there's going to come a figure who is going to suffer personally for the redemption of the country. So potentially there's four different people that the, that the, um, the population is going, hmm, So, with that background, when John the Baptist shows up and causes such a stir, an official delegation is sent from Jerusalem to find out who he is. It's in John, right in the beginning of John's Gospel. You don't need to turn there, I'll I'll, uh, I'll read it, it's very short. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. 
He did not fail to confess. He confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. That's the big question. Are you the Messiah? No. Well, then they said, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? Not a prophet, are you the prophet? Meaning the prophet who is like Moses. Are you him? No. Well, then who are you? If you don't fit one of those categories, who are you? Give us an answer to take back those to sent, to sent, who have sent us. What do you say about yourself? And that's where he quotes, I am a voice of one calling in the wilderness. That's what's behind that little interaction there. These questions about who is John the Baptist? Well, they were asking the same sorts of questions about Jesus. When the disciples first catch wind to him, one of them runs to his brother and says, we think we found the Messiah. Everybody's looking for the Messiah. So who is this guy? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Who is this guy who's reported, reputed to be a wonder worker? Is he the Messiah? Maybe. Is he the prophet? Is he the prophet like Moses? Hmm. If you remember the Exodus story, that's where Moses fits in. The people were wandering around in the wilderness. Remember, they got out of Egypt, but they were wandering around the wilderness. What were they eating? Manna. The story of Moses and the people of Israel, manna is right in the middle of that. And if you remember, there's also God sent birds at one point, so they would have meat to eat also because they were complaining. There's a psalm, part of the psalm deals with this. Psalm 78, starting in verse 17, it's very, very lengthy. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? I mean, can God feed us out here in the middle of nowhere? True, he struck the rock and water gushed out. Streams flowed abundantly, but can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? And when the Lord heard them, he was furious. His fire broke out against Jacob. His wrath rose against Israel because they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens and rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Human beings ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. Abundance. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and by his power made the south wind blow and he rained meat down on them like dust, birds like the sand of the seashore. He made them come down inside the camp and around their tents and they ate till they were gorged. And he had given them what they craved. Then it goes bad. <laughs> so the people would have been familiar with their own history. Moses, Exodus, manna, they would have been familiar with that, and they would have been familiar with that psalm. What do you think they thought of Jesus when he starts multiplying food? The parallels to the giving of man in the wilderness and what Jesus was doing are really interesting. Large group of people, out in the middle of nowhere, nobody around, long, a desolate, open place, empty area, Miraculous provision of, of, of bread, miraculous provision of meat, and in abundance, leftover. Do you see the parallels? So did the people. Look what happens. It's worth looking at the different, um, uh, it's in all four Gospels, it's worth comparing them. But in John's Gospel, it's in John 6, same chapter, uh, but of John 6. The same story, the feeding of the 5,000. But John adds something that the others don't. It's in chapter 6, verse 13. Where is it? Oh, there it is. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. They gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves. That's one of the interesting things John mentions. He mentions what kind of bread it was. 
left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. They saw the connection. They saw what Jesus had done. They saw the parallels and said, that's who we've been waiting for for over a thousand years. He's here, he's arrived. It's this guy. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountains by himself. They came that close to having a rebellion against Rome, focused around Jesus. It was just, <laughs> there, were, there undoubtedly were Roman sympathizers and Roman informants in the crowd. Rome was not going to sit still for this, and Jesus knew this. So this, this has to stop right now. But that was the expectation that the people had. Jesus is this long-awaited prophet. So they recognize this, this spectacular miracle. They recognize the parallels to Moses and the, and the bread from heaven and the meat from heaven. And they concluded that Jesus was the prophet, this prophet like Moses. But they stopped there. They made that connection, but they stopped there. And they did not carry on and think the implications of what Jesus had done were not immediately clear. And they weren't clear to the disciples, and they're not clear to us either, typically, if you haven't thought this through. And when I read, when I first was reading this, studying this, I've been reading through Mark repeatedly for over the past year. And when I, I had never seen that connection. And they were terrified because they did not understand about the loaves. It's like, what an odd thing to say about a miracle that's unrelated <laughs> to the loaves and fishes. What's, what does that have to do with anything? So I've been looking into this, trying to find out what, what did they miss? Because if I don't see it, guess what? I missed it too. So their hearts were hardened. Is my heart hardened? I didn't see it, I didn't make the connection. The implications of what Jesus had done were not immediately clear. The promised prophet, like Moses, that had been so long expected, had come. They didn't miss that, but he was, in fact, far, far greater than Moses. And that's what they missed. So the crowd, seeing the similarities between Moses, manna, birds, Jesus, bread, fish, seeing that, they make the connection. But there's something that the crowd missed and also Jesus' own disciples missed it. And that's what's being referred to when they said they had gained no insight from the loaves. Think, during the time of Moses and the Exodus, bread came out of the sky, manna came out of the sky, birds came in miraculously. Who provided that? Was it Moses? Who provided it? God did. Jesus scolds some of the religious leaders in the, I think it's the book of John. He said, You're, you know, Moses is getting credit for this. It's God who sent that, who sent the food. It was God who provided the bread. It was God who provided the meat miraculously for the people of Israel. What did Jesus do? In the feeding of the 5,000, notice what doesn't happen. Jesus does not pray and ask God for a miracle. Does that mean something? What happened? Now, this is my own idea, and I'm going to try to flesh this out later. It's an interesting idea. It says, depending on the translation, Jesus blessed the food, Jesus prayed, something along those lines. A typical Jewish blessing over food, when we talk about well, who's going to say the blessing at Thanksgiving? Well, what are we actually doing? We thank God. We don't, do, we don't walk up to the, the bread and go, you know, we don't sprinkle it with holy water. We thank God. We bless God. We praise God because he has provided this food. A typical Jewish blessing, they didn't bless the food. They didn't feel like they were qualified to. They blessed God and thanked God. And the blessing went something like this. Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. 
What did Jesus do? It says Jesus blessed the food. And what happens? The verb tense is Jesus gave to the disciples and kept on giving. No explanation of exactly what was going on, but the food just kept coming from his hand. The basic story is very straightforward. Like I said, most Sunday school kids could tell you this. Bunch of people out in the middle of nowhere, they don't have any food, Jesus feeds them, miracle. End of story. But the question is, do we have a deeper understanding of this miracle than the VBS level, from the vacation Bible school level? And what I came to realize is that I didn't. I never put the pieces together. I can't blame the disciples. I didn't spot it either. Have we given this some thought and gained some insight, some understanding about the loaves? What was it they didn't catch? What is it that we're not catching? Or, to put it another way, could Jesus say to you or say to me, do you have eyes but you don't see? Do you have ears but you don't hear? Is your heart hardened? Do you really not understand who I am? Think of it this way, there are levels of understanding of the, 5, 000, of the feeding of the 5,000. One is at the most basic level, there's food. Picture a guy out there in the crowd and they're passing the food out and he's just like, he's putting the food in his pocket. And he's like, this is unbelievable, I've never had this much food in my life, which is probably true of a lot of the people that were there. They'd never seen this much food. They had never eaten until they couldn't eat anymore. So he's just shoveling it in, shoveling it in. And so the person beside him goes, hey, where's all this food coming from? This looks like a miracle. And the guy goes, who cares? There's a lot of it. Ask me the fish. So that's the most basic level. The second level is the, is the person who's talking to him. This is a miracle. This is, this is not normal. There's something, this is miraculous. Jesus has just performed a miracle. Okay, that's a step up. Then they put it together and go, Oh, wait, this is the prophet. This is the prophet like Moses we've been looking for. There's another level. But if you stop there, you have not figured out what the feeding of the 5,000 was about. Jesus did this on purpose. Most of Jesus' miracles, there's, there's many of them are said, he heals somebody and goes, don't tell anybody. You ever wondered about that? He raises Jairus' daughter, runs everybody out of the house, raises the daughter, and then tells the parents, don't tell anybody about what just happened here. Just, he heals a blind guy. Don't even go back into the village. He heals a leper. Go to the priest. Don't talk to anybody on the way. Go to the priest and have yourself declared clean. Keep your mouth shut. Just, he's not trying to draw attention, typically. Here, he's making a statement. This was done on purpose. This is Jesus' most public miracle that we have. He had done miracles in front of other crowds because there were crowds around him constantly. This was a setup. This was done this way on purpose because he was deliberately making parallels between the manna and the bread to say something about him. The feeding of the 5,000 was not just another miracle performed by Jesus. This is loaded with deeper meaning. So you have the first level, food. More, more. Second, miracle. Third, Jesus is the prophet. But when you ask the question, where did the food come from? Where did the manna come from? All of a sudden, the light bulbs go on. What's he doing? He's God. The disciples missed it. They didn't understand, they did not comprehend who they were dealing with. They had way underestimated Jesus and who he actually was. Jesus was far more than how they viewed him, and they would not have a clear understanding of that until after the resurrection. The resurrection was the crowning statement about who Jesus really was. But there are hints of it, and fingers that point, and signs that point to it all the way through the Gospels, and this is one of them, if you have the eyes to see it. See, if they had known that Jesus was God in the flesh, Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee wouldn't have frightened them. 
He's God. Of course he can walk on the earth. He can do whatever he wants. He's, he's supreme. He rules over the physical world. They wouldn't think they were seeing a ghost because they saw a figure out there that looked like Jesus. And they go, well, that can't be Jesus because people don't walk on the water. So we're dealing with a ghost or a spirit or a demon or something. And that's why they were scared. If they knew who Jesus actually was, they wouldn't have reacted like that. And that's what the insight, that's what that's a reference to, I believe. That's the insight that they missed. They had gained nothing from the lobes. They'd not drawn the parallels. They'd not connected the dots. Jesus' feeding of the multitude is a display of his deity. But only those who have eyes to see it and hearts that are not hardened or closed will make the connections. The disciples didn't know who they were dealing with. And the big question is, do we? Do you? Thank you. We are called to respond to the word of God and we will do that today by singing hymn number 101. Um, this is a familiar tune for you. It is a little different rhythm, but you'll catch on. And as an added treat, we're gonna sing the Amen at the end today. You may be seated. It is a privilege to come to the Lord in prayer. 
So bow with me if you would. Holy, holy, holy. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You speak peace to your people. You provide, you protect, you defend. You are the breath of life, the living water, the bread of life. You sustain and nourish and strengthen us. Father, there are so many things that we come to you. You are the only hope that we have, but you are more than enough. You are hope, the way, the truth, the life. We ask you to be with those among us who are ill, those suffering from colds, flus, COVID, we ask you to be with those who are experiencing cancer and other debilitating diseases. We ask you to bring comfort and help to caregivers and to all who are hurting. We pray that you would be with the Gisek family, that you would be very close, hold them close, so close that they can hear your heartbeat because their ear is pressed to your chest. We pray for Fran as she's starting a new kind of life. We pray for those who are not able to be with us, who, ha who suffer from memory issues and other physical things that cause them to worship online. We thank you, Father, that you have given us the ability to share in our worship services with people who cannot be here in person. Father, we pray and ask your mercy for the things that are going on in our world. We don't understand how we can have fallen so far from you. But this world is not our home, and we are called to be different, to be peculiar, to not go the way of the world. So, Father, I pray your protection on us as we follow your, your leading to live separate lives. I thank you for this congregation where we can come and be encouraged and helped and strengthened. I thank you for the Good News Club. Lord, the world is not coming to us. Show us how to go out into the world. You are a great and mighty God. You have a plan for us, a plan to prosper us and help us. You are with us every step of the way, and we praise you for that. You go before us. You go behind us. You are our help, our salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this. And you have taught us to pray, and we pray today in the way that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the part of our service now where we think about what God has done for us and we return in direct proportion to him what he has given to us. We can't outgive God. It is your tithes and offerings that support Good News Club and other ministries. And uh, we ask as Martha, uh, Martha, Marcia, as Marcia plays the offertory today, that you would consider what God has done for you what he is calling you to do, and how you can be obedient to his calling. Listen now to our offertory.
Lord, we thank you for all that you have given us. We understand that we are just stewards of what you have given. These resources are ours just to use for a time. They belong to you. We dedicate our lives, our hearts, our hands, our work, our tithes, and our offerings to you for your use. Take them and multiply them like the loaves and fishes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would stand and let's praise God with the doxology. Now we will affirm together our faith as we read together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. We will close today by singing, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, page 128. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord. We will say our charge, our blessing and charge with our vision and mission and, and 
ask, invite you to come upstairs for coffee afterwards, to walk in the light of God, making Jesus known is first at first. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.